Well, for more on artificial intelligence in China, I'm joined live via Skype by Nina Xiang, founder of China Money Network and author of Red AI, Victories and Warnings from China's Rise in Artificial Intelligence. Welcome back to the show. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. So first off, what does the popularity of these virtual boyfriends reflect about people's emotional needs right now? And how can AI help? Well, this is a classic example of tech-generated demand. People never had We seem to be having some technical difficulties with our guest. Hopefully, we'll be able to get her back shortly. Oh, I believe she's joining us now. Nina, are you with us? Yes, I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we lost you there for a second. So yes, you're talking about the role of AI when it comes to helping people with their emotions, especially right now. Right, so I, I was just saying that this is a classic example of a tech-generated demand because people never had virtual boyfriends before and they live their life just fine. And so do we really need virtual boyfriends emotionally? This company's team believes so, so we'll have to wait and see if it sticks with its users. But if we look at virtual, uh, if we look at voice assistant, which is another AI product, we are seeing how people are using uh, voice assistant very differently from how the teams perhaps originally expect them to. And we might see the same thing happening with virtual boyfriends. People might be using it differently. But uh, virtual boyfriends can definitely feel some emotional gaps. Uh, but like everything else, it's likely going to have some negative side effects as well. And finally, there's nothing virtual that can replace having the real thing. So then to that point then, talk about AI and also robots roles in the near term. Is it more about replacing people, assisting them or filling some other sort of need? Right. So, you know, when, when we talk about robots, people often, in, you know, envision in their mind a human-like being. But nowadays, when you talk about AI, uh, in many cases, it's just a piece of software that can either help us uh, convert voice to text, do translation, answer simple questions, recommend movies we like to watch or things we like to buy. So I think in the future, certain things like customer service representatives or software engineers, we will see their jobs being replaced by robots uh, in other physical, especially repetitive physical work like moving and sorting packages, driving and manufacturing. Those jobs may be replaced by robots as well. But in other places like parenting, surgeons or boyfriends, I don't think we'll ever have a really a robot that can truly replace humans. Now, it's interesting because the global CEO of Microsoft predicts that there are going to be more AI beings than human beings eventually. Do you agree with that? And what sort of time frame could we be looking at? Right. It really depends on how you define an AI being. Uh, is a recommendation engine an AI being? Is my uh, voice assistant uh, an AI being? I quite like to say that if you want to build a human-like robot, you ought to start from building a stomach first. Because without the physical and survival instincts, uh, a, a robot can really never truly be human-like. But then the other question is, why do we want to build a human-like robot? Human intelligence is full of flaws. We're very forgetful. Our brain is terrible at computing with very small uh, storage. And we are prone to make very stupid mistakes. So I think robots should be built as tools that augment and help humans to overcome our many flaws and make us better. So in that sense, whether we have more AI beings or human beings really doesn't matter. Now, it might matter, though, to employers. I mean, robots, they don't need insurance. They don't have to pay taxes. And some countries even have subsidies for, com for companies who acquire more robots into production. So with all these benefits, what's the incentive for companies to keep hiring more people instead of robots, especially with this downturn in jobs that we're already seeing because of the pandemic? Right. Um with the pandemic, I do feel, you know, that the, the, the pandemic or even the end of the pandemic will have uh, likely very uh, insignificant impact on the uh, general long-term trend of automation, which is going to follow uh, its own uh, trajectory depending on tech readiness and user demand. I think in terms of long-term uh, automation trends, there are two places where we're going to see uh, deepened automation in the next several decades. One includes 
includes uh, one are the type of jobs that involves a lot of uh, data processing. So here you can think about uh, software that can read x-ray and identify diseases. You can think about uh, machine translation uh, or even uh, software that can uh, write uh, uh, computer programs. Uh, another type of uh, places where we're going to see increased automation are physical work such as sorting and moving packages, uh, driving and manufacturing. So those places will be uh, another place we're going to see deepened uh, automation and we're not going to see those trends reversed.